So let's suppose we have this car, and it's not just any car, it's a rocket car. So it has these, turn on the thrusters and <laughs> flames shoot out. A uh, big thrust, and the, and the car shoots down the track. Or maybe I should say the car shoots down uh, the salt flats in Utah and Nevada. And let's say uh, this car starts at some point, I'm going to call A right here. And a long time later, it ends up over at B. And what I want to do is apply the work energy principle to this car. The work energy principle simply says that the work in going from point A to point B is the change in kinetic energy. So kinetic energy when we reach point B uh, minus kinetic energy at point A. Now in setting up these work energy problems, it's usually the kinetic energy that's really easy. And the work, you know, depending upon what you have, this part could be hard. Maybe I should say harder. And how hard this part is usually depends upon the types of forces that you can have in this problem. So what I'd like to do is tackle the work term and see what we can make of it. So in calculating what this work, why don't we just go straight to the definition. So the work in going from A to B is what? We take these, these forces, you add them all up, you take the dot product with dr. dr is this little incremental uh, change in your position and you integrate from point A to point B. And since forces are involved here, it's completely, completely appropriate to draw a free body diagram for this thing. My, my car I'm just going to represent as a block, FBD. And what are the forces acting on this, on this block or this car? Well, obviously I have a weight, so I'll call that minus mg in the j hat direction, where i and j are the usual horizontal and vertical directions respectively. I'll let n denote the normal force from the road or from the salt flats coming back up on this thing. And then I have the thrust force for my rocket, right? So I've tried to draw in this picture this thrust sort of pushing down into the right a little bit. So I'm going to draw my force, my thrust force, sort of like that. I've got a downward sort of push to it just to keep the, the rocket car glued to the, to the salt flats. Don't want it to go airborne. Uh, rocket cars aren't good airborne. So there I have it. Maybe I'll put this F into components too. So F, let's call that F uh, cosine theta in the I hat direction plus F sine in the J hat direction where, of course, uh, this angle right there would be theta. Oops, and I just noticed I've already made a mistake. Notice that this force F, its vertical component is actually downward, which is in the minus J hat direction. So what I'm going to do is, woo, is erase right there and put in a minus sign. So now I think my free body diagram is in good shape. Also in this work calculation is a dr, and that's a vector right there. So don't forget to put the little tilde underneath it. And what's dr? dr is an incremental change in position. So dr is going to be a vector that looks kind of like this on the road. I'll call it dr. And notice that dr is all in the i hat direction, right? This, this car is moving horizontally in the direction of i-hat, so I'm going to call dr, I'll call it ds, it's a sort of incremental change in position, I'll give its vector in the i-hat direction like so. Alright, so what I'm going to do next is make a little table, a table that sort of lists out the forces that I have and and what type of work they produce. Uh, I'll start with the weight, I'll put them in order when, we, when I put them on the free body diagram, and the weight, notice the weight is perpendicular to d, dr, right? So the weight is downward in the j-hat direction, uh, dr is in the i hat direction, so j dot i or i dot j, that's zero. So work, work is no work because uh, the weight is perpendicular to dr. So let's move on to the next one. I got a normal force and it is also in the j hat direction, so once again it produces no work and it does for the same exact reason. The normal force is per perpendicular to dr, so that dot product is zero. Now let's move on to the, the, the thrust force. And notice what we have here. Part of it is in the I hat direction. And then I got another part in the J hat direction. So when I take F dot dr, I'm going to get I dot I, which is 1. So I get the F cosine theta ds, or the J hat dot I hat. That's going to be 0. So only this horizontal component does work. And that's what I'll say in my little table here. All right, now I think we're ready to write out the integral. Remember in our work calculation that some of the forces dot dr, when we sum these forces and dot product with dr, only one piece, this horizontal piece of the 
of the thrust force makes a contribution. So let's just work that part out. So the work can go from A to B. This is integral, and my integral in this case, again, the, just the horizontal piece appears. So I got F cosine theta, and then I've got the dr is just ds and the i. When I do the dot product, the i get collapsed with that i. So this is just F cosine theta ds. Now, let's suppose, or let's make an assumption here. I haven't told you this explicitly, but let's suppose this this thrust force is constant. So you, you turn on the switch and then boom, you're hit with 20,000 pounds of thrust or whatever it is. And let's suppose this angle is constant. We're not popping a wheelie or anything like that. So this, this thrust angle is constant. In that case, uh, in my integral here, this part would be a constant and I'm just integrating with I'm just integrating the ds. So this thing is going to be just uh, f cosine theta times s. f and cosine theta are just constants, so we're integrating ds to get s. And we have to evaluate this at the limit, so call this s at position a and s at position b. So I guess we can integrate this, or put in the boundary conditions, and say f cosine theta times sb minus sa. Now let's be careful about what, what sb and sa are. So sb would, excuse me, sa would be the position or the coordinate of this, the car location when we're at point A. And similarly, sb would be the coordinate location when we're at point B. And what appears in my integral is the difference sb minus sa. So really what matters is not so much the exact coordinate or coordinates at, at one end and the other. What matters is the difference. So what matters is the amount we have traveled. And let me just call the amount we travel L. And in that case, the work in going from A to B is just F times a cosine of theta times L. So in this case, the work is very simple. It has two pieces. One is the force that performs the work, and or in this case, actually, the component of the force that performs the work, right? All these other forces are perpendicular. They don't do any work at all. We just pull out the horizontal component, or I should say the part that's tangent to the direction of motion, and that's that part of the work. And then the other part of the work is this one right here, which is the total distance traveled. And again, this is probably the most uh, simple case of, of a work. It's just a force times a distance directly. And whenever we have a constant force, a force is not changing as, as, the, as the thing's moving, this is what we're going to get. So my rule of thumb, I'll write over here, I say whenever the force is constant, then the work is equal to the constant force times the distance traveled. Maybe I should be a little more careful there. It's really, when I talk about constant force, I'm talking about the component of the constant force that's doing the work, in this case F cosine theta, and then the distance traveled L. Another thing worth noting is that sine, S-I-G-N, whether it's positive or negative, is very important. So work is a sine variable. It can be both either positive or negative. So in this case, our force, the horizontal component which is doing work, points in the same direction as my dr, the direction of motion. So therefore, these things produce a positive work. If my car happened to be moving backwards, maybe it was pushed down a hill or something like that, and it's moving backwards, and I turn on the thrust, and the force was a, th is a positive thrust forward, then the thrust would actually be doing negative work because it would be opposing the motion of the vehicle. Okay, so sign is important here. All right, so now the question comes up, how would you use this uh, work energy principle in solving a problem? So let's take a problem that is more or less the problem we just saw. So I call this one the rocket car. So let's suppose we have this rocket car, uh, we're given the mass of the car, we're given the theta, the, this angle at which the, the uh, rocket is pointed relative to horizontal, we're given the length of the stretch of, of track or salt flats, we're given g in case that's needed, we're told that the, the thrust of the rocket is constant, f, and we're given the initial speed of the car is zero, and we want to find the speed at point b, a distance l down the track. So the way I would solve this is as outlined here, or actually exactly solved here. So the first thing I would do is draw a free body diagram. Free body diagrams I'm going to say are mandatory for these work energy problems because they have forces in there that you have to enumerate uh, in order to work out these problems correctly. So here's my free body diagram. I've got the, the weight, the normal, the rocket thrust, just like in, in the, in the write-up we just did. Um, we're saying the thrust has two pieces. I split it up into the I and the J hat components. 
I make an observation, observations are good in, in working out problems, that only this horizontal part of the thrust does work. In other words, normal force, weight, and that vertical component do no work whatsoever because it is uh, perpendicular to the, to the path of motion or direction of motion. Then I state uh, the physical principle I'm using. The physical principle we're using is work energy. I can just state that if you like, but I also like to write down the equation. This is working going from A to B is a change in kinetic energy. And then right now, rather than do the integral, we have given you a real rule of thumb. We've already sort of worked it out once, but whenever you have a constant force, uh, the work is that constant force times the length. You don't have to do that integral again, ever again, if you don't want to, as long as it satisfies the the, the conditions of my rule of thumb and be sure to get the sign correct uh, but in this case the work is F times cosine theta L and that he has to equal the change in kinetic energy we are told that we initially started at zero speed so VA is zero so therefore I can just solve for VB which is this guy and and that's it that's a square root there and that's my answer I check the units I always have to check the units a force, this is my thrust force, F. It has units of mass length per time squared. My track length has a unit of length. Uh, my mass here is a mass. And if you combine terms, you notice that the masses cancel each other out. So I got length squared over time squared. Square root, that's a length over time. And that's exactly what I want out of a speed. It's a length per time. It's a mile per hour. It's a feet per second. It's a kilometer per per day, whatever this thing is. Hopefully a rocket car is going more than a kilometer per day. But that's it. Notice how simple it is. I fit it on uh, three quarters of a page, writing quite big. I, I didn't really have to integrate anything. I sort of integrated something uh, to begin with, but once I knew the expression for that work, wow, this problem was a breeze. I did it in just a few lines. That's the beauty of these work energy problems.